Morning. Morning. So, life-changing moments. Um, so what is this all about? Um, well, there are many things that can happen in our life that can, can be a life-changing moment. For example, deciding to leave home. Maybe you can remember the, the day when you decided to do that, and that was like a new beginning, and it really changed your life. Or um, meeting your life partner. Yes. So I met my life partner. Where is she? There, there she is. Yes. 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 That was life changing. Of course, in our movement, we uh, we have the blessing. So that's that is quite life changing. Yes. I never met her in my life, but there she was suddenly. Yes. <laughs> and um, becoming a parent. We have a few parents here. Yes. That's a life changing. That's a, a a big change in your life. And uh, of course, now being a grandparent is even a is another change. So it's uh, all these changes. Uh, like there's some some new, something new happening, and maybe we we change inside because we have new responsibilities. And um, death of a loved one, that's very life changing. And um, how does that affect our life when that happens? And then choosing your life's path. So I've chosen my life's path. And uh, all, all of the um, older people amongst us, first generation, there was a point in your life where you decided to join this movement. And I suppose uh, for many of us, or I, especially I think for me, this was the biggest kind of life-changing moment. A whole new direction in my life. And. Um, moving to another country. So I have come to Sweden. Uh, many of us were born somewhere else and are now living here. That's made a, a big difference to my life and I'm sure to all of our lives. Um, of course, um, you know, if somebody has a life-threatening illness or a, a life-threatening accident, this also can uh, dramatically change our lives. But um, I suppose that a spiritual awakening Whatever happens in our life externally, it can affect how we are inside. And, and I would say that when I joined this movement, that was a spiritual awakening. I, it was like a, um, a kind of aha moment or a, a kind of a, an awakening inside of me. So this is, this is my life. Dramatic change. So I have some questions for you. Have you had a life-changing moment? Or maybe, maybe you've had many. Or is there one that stands out? For example, deciding to join this movement. And um, for me, when I, I uh, decided to join, it's like I felt such excitement. I thought, this is it, you know. This is what life's about. The Messiah's on the earth. And... Uh, I want to give my life to do God's will. I mean, that's dramatic. Not many people do that. What about the younger ones amongst, us, amongst you? You know, you were born into this movement. Uh, so uh, the, the question is, what um, impact has a life-changing moment had on your life? What difference has it made? And um, why did you join our movement? Why did you join? Or if you are younger people, why, are you, why, why did you decide to be part of this? Because many are not here. Many of the first generation are not here. Many of the second generation. Yeah? So the question is, why have you stayed? Why are you still here? Are you benefiting from being here? Do you wish you were doing something else? Or no, this is your life's path. Are you going to, are you going to stay in this movement until the day you die? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, if you've made it this far, <laughs> if you made it this far, you probably will. So, our movement was started by our, uh, by our true fathers, Sam Young Moon, Reverend Sam Young Moon. And actually, our whole movement started because he had a life-changing moment. So let's look at that. So, um, he was born in 1920. He died in 2012. He lived for 92 or three years. And he dedicated his whole life 
to do God's will. And then he created a worldwide movement. And, um, but it all started when he was a young man. Actually, this picture of him, he's kind of, I think, in his early 20s. But it was when he was 15 years of age, that was his life-changing movement. And he says this. You know, at that time uh, in Korea, in the 1920s, Korea was ruled and dominated by the Japanese. And people, the Korean people suffered very much. And he saw this suffering. He was born into a Confucian family. And when he was 10, his parents um, converted to Christianity. And um, so uh, he became a Sunday school teacher. Yeah? And he took God's word seriously. But when he saw the suffering around him, and he, he learned about the God of love, he, he couldn't understand like why, why people suffer so much. And this is what he said. I began spending more and more time in prayer to the point that I began praying through the night. As a result, I had a rare and precious experience in which God answered my prayers. That day will always remain as the most cherished memory of my life, a day I can never forget. It was the night before Easter in the year I turned 15, so this was 1935. I was on Mount Mayudu, praying all night and begging God in tears for answers. Why had he created a world so filled with sorrow and despair? Why was the all-knowing and all-powerful God leaving the world in such pain? What should I do for my tragic homeland? So it came, you know, he... he he had so many questions and so many struggles within himself and searching for answers. And when he was praying, this is the moment that Jesus appeared to him. This is where it all started. This moment. And this is what he said. On Easter morning, after I had made a long, tearful prayer, Jesus Christ appeared to me. He told me deep and amazing things. He said that God is grieved because of the suffering of humanity. He asked me to undertake a special role on earth for the sake of God's work. So Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. But the words he said have been misinterpreted or misunderstood. And so this idea that God is a God, uh, you know, of bliss and peace and happiness. But what Jesus was saying, no, he's suffering. Because we're suffering. Because he's like a parent, a God of love. Like we as parents of our children suffer, we cannot be happy. Even though we have tremendous love for them. And then he chose some young moon to, to, to actually spread a new message. So what did he do? 15 years of age. If you were 15 years of age and you had a dramatic experience like this, and you were asked to take on... Oh, 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 uh, like a, uh, a role to change the world. How would you react? Well, at first he said, no. <laughs> I cannot do this. This is too much for me to bear. And it took Jesus asking three times when Jesus said, there's no one else. You know, you are the one that God has chosen. So he accepted it, but when he accepted it, he understood that he would have to go through a lot of suffering like Jesus had. But he made this commitment. In the quietude of a deep Korean mountain, I talked with Jesus several times. So this was the first meeting with Jesus, but he had many meetings with him. The truth revealed at the time forms the core of the divine principle. Ever since that special meeting, little by little, God taught me this amazing truth. Through it, I could see the dawn of a glorious new culture. This special revelation has the power to bring all religions together. And I have received an order from God to spread the divine principle to the ends of the earth. What a dramatic uh, order. <laughs> an order from God. How many people could do this? He had to be so determined 
that he would take up this mission. And then later he says, if we apply this truth to society, we can resolve all social problems. If we apply it to the world, we can resolve all global problems. Furthermore, we can resolve deep religious problems and stalemates in philosophy. Divine principle is an integrated thought system that embraces all religious doctrines and philosophical tenets as one whole while preserving the unique characteristics of each. Do you believe this? Do you believe that the truth and the divine principle can change the world, can solve all problems? So even though many, many years have passed, here we are, a small community. We've held on to this vision and to this dream. How long did it take for Jesus' message to be accepted by the Roman Empire? Almost 400 years. And Jesus died on the cross. Father didn't die on the cross. Actually, we have a worldwide movement. And uh, just before the pandemic, this World Summit in Korea gathered together people from all walks of life. And I remember Newt Gingrich, who used to be the, uh, the, the, the Congress, kind of the leader of the House of Congress in America. He said what was remarkable about this meeting is bringing diverse people together in one place. And that is an example of the power of the divine principle or the vision that Father had to bring the world together. So even though we are a small community, I have hope. I have great hope. That's why I'm still here. <laughs> Some people left because they lost hope. Well, where, where's the ideal world, you know? Well, but I have hope. So, um, this was his life-changing moment. Aren't we grateful? Aren't we fortunate that one man could make that decision all those years ago? So, actually, that moment was a spiritually transformative experience. It, he, his uh, spiritual eyes were open. And he received um, this spiritual guidance. But it took him actually nine years before he could really receive all the information. He had to keep asking and searching and reading the Bible. It wasn't just given to him. Same with us. If we want to have kind of to really experience God, we have to keep searching, keep asking, keep trying, not give up. So these life-changing moments, I would say, it's really like spiritually transformative experiences is what, what really makes a difference. Different external things can happen in our life, but what really matters is a change inside. But this term, spiritual transformative experience, is a term that was coined by one person. And that person, oh yeah, let me just read what it says here. Spiritual transformative experiences is an umbrella term for a wide range of spiritual and paranormal experiences which causes people to perceive themselves and the world profoundly differently and often causes a spiritual awakening. I would say that when I decided to join this movement, I had some spiritually transformative experience. I didn't see anything, but I felt something. I felt such excitement. You know, something alive came inside of me. I thought, wow, this is it. So when we talk about spiritual experiences, it's not that we kind of are psychic, you know, or we can see spiritual things, but there's something transforms inside of us. And I suppose because of that transformative experience inside of me, that's why I joined. So I can always look back to that moment. I can't deny what I experienced. But this term, um, this umbrella term includes these things, mystical experiences, where people feel this kind of oneness with everything, or near-death experiences where people experience the presence of God in the other side. Psychic awakening, so like our spiritual gifts. So we have five 
um, physical senses, but also five spiritual senses. And some people, those spiritual senses are awakened. And then out-of-body experiences. Some have experienced leaving their body while they're sleeping, coming back. Kundalini awakenings. This is something that yogi, like um, in meditation, um, people experience this kind of uh, energy rising up in, in through their body and then leaving their body and having an expanded awareness of reality. And then inspired creativity. This also is like a spiritually transformative uh, moment where you get a download of kind of a, an inspiration. And many of the great uh, people of the past, like scientists who, who had some kind of a flash of insight, so who is the person that coined this term? This is Dr. Yvonne Kaysson. She was born the same year as me, 1953. So her story, I kind of uh, think about my life. How does that coincide with her life and my life? So <clears throat> she, uh, she wrote this. She's written several books. She has, um, she's very well known in Canada. And um, she's a medical doctor but she went on a spiritual journey. And this book called Soul Lessons from the Light, underneath it says, how spiritually transformative experiences changed my life. So we talk about those moments. She had many moments, dramatic moments. And the question is, what can we learn from her, from her experiences? So she had multiple spiritually transformative experiences. She was born in 1953, and at five years of age, she was standing at this train station with her parents, and she saw this workman kind of get off the platform, go down to the line, and went up to the other side. And she thought, oh, I'd like to do that. So she stepped off the platform, right? In that moment, she actually, everything was suspended. She left her body and uh, didn't know what was going on. And then, uh, th then a train was coming, but someone pulled her back. That was her first experience of leaving her body and thinking, well, what, what is this? But she didn't understand it. She didn't know this was a near-death experience until later. Then, in 1964, she was involved in a car accident with her family. She was 11 years of age, and uh, she was, um, you, you know, her family members were being pulled out, uh, and they couldn't find her. But she was floating above her body, and she could hear conversations that were going on. And um, so that was her second experience, near death, leaving a body. But she didn't understand what that meant. She thought this was quite normal, you know, everyone could do this. Then, in 1976, that's the year I joined our movement, 23 years of age, um, this, uh, okay, so she trained as a medical doctor. In the last year of her studies, she um, wanted to Im kind of to improve her uh, memory and her kind of focus and her studies, so uh, she went to a meditation, meditation group. And... Uh, uh, meditation, like it was easy for her. She really enjoyed it. She started meditating an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. And then that year, in 1976, this is when she had this Kundalini awakening. So this awakening normally happens to people who've been practicing yoga for many, many years. It's this time of enlightenment. But this is what happened to her. 1976, she says this. About 20 minutes into my meditation, I suddenly felt a strong wave of energy rush up my spine. As the energy reached the top of my head, I felt my consciousness rise up out of my body. I no longer felt that I was the size of my body or my head. I felt I had expanded to the size of the large auditorium where I was seated. She was in a, a group meditation. My consciousness filled with light and exquisite feelings of love and bliss. It was as if I had become pure love itself. This experience 
was kind of very dramatic for her. And this is where it kind of she's, when this happened, she asked her teacher, her yoga teacher, you know, what happened? And uh, they said, well, that couldn't be a Kundalini experience because um, you know, that, that takes years and years of practice. So she, she, but she thought, oh, well, this is what happens in yoga. And, and she tried again, but it never happened again. So next, what happened in 1979? Well, because of this kind of experience, I have to go back a bit, she started getting interested in Eastern religions. And she read books about this Kundalini awakening. And then um, she wanted to understand what happened to her. And she even went to India to meet the author of these books. And um, <coughs> so... That would, but, but then, in 1979, she had a medevac plane crash near death experience. Medevac <coughs> means uh, medical evacuation. She uh, was traveling in a small aeroplane, this, like, like this. Uh, there was the pilot, there was her as a nurse and an assistant nurse, and a seriously ill patient who was being on a, in a stretcher, and she was being taken home um, to a remote part of Canada. We couldn't be reached any other way. But on this particular day, there was a snowstorm, and this plane experienced a lot of turbulence. And then one of the engines failed, <laughs> and the pilot was trying to keep it afloat, and then, then the engine started, then the other engine stopped, and then and he had to make an emergency landing. And he came down on this, uh, this lake, yes? But this lake, it, this was very stormy. It was very turbulent. And uh, this plane had wheels because it had started on land, was it meant to end on land. And he was hoping that, well, there was ice there, that it would land on the ice. But actually, as it landed, it started to sink because the ice was very thin. And so what they're going to do? The nurses tried to get this um, patient out on the stretcher, couldn't get her out. Uh, the door was jammed. The pilot banged it open. They managed to get out, but they couldn't help this, uh, this lady, this sick lady. And they have to swim. And uh, she was a good swimmer, but it's stormy, you know, and it's ice cold. This is kind of, I think, November time. So uh, she, uh, she's, she's trying to reach... Like, like there's an island there uh, nearby and, uh, and then she goes under the water and she comes up again and she goes under the water and then what happens is that she uh, she leaves her body and, and, th and then she's kind of all of the struggle goes but she's also conscious of the fact that she's still trying to swim 95% of her is kind of in this other reality but she's see seeing herself struggling in the water. And she says this, As I continued my struggle to stay afloat and swim through the fast-moving frigid water, I suddenly found myself looking down at my body struggling through the water below. My spirit and main point of perception then moved further upwards to a space filled with bright white light and a powerful feeling of unconditional love. And then she came back into her body. And uh, she's try, trying to get to land. And then she saw this branch. And actually the, the waves were moving towards. And the branch looked like a hand, like an arm outstretched. And she managed to get to it. Uh, the pilot, um, he could swim. And he managed to get to land. But the other nurse, she couldn't swim, but she was holding on to, to some branch somewhere. Now, the thing is, <laughs> this is the middle of nowhere, but they were saved. They were saved because just before the pilot's plane went down, he sent like a mayday message, which was picked up by an aeroplane, uh, uh, like a passenger aeroplane not so far away, and they sent it to the le nearest airport, and there were people there available who could get into a helicopter, <laughs> and actually what happened... Uh, 
is they could save save them. But um, I have to say a bit more because while, while this was going on, she actually left her body completely. And she, she went up into this uh, realm of light and she says this. I felt I, I was being permeated, embraced and cradled by a vast, profoundly loving, intelligent force. I immediately knew somehow in my soul that this omnipotent, intelligent force was the power behind the universe, what I call God. And then, as I say, then she came back into her body and she was rescued. The mystical near-death experience I had during the 1979 Medivac plane crash transformed me and forever changed the course of my life. So you could say this was the most profound life-changing moment for her, even though she'd had other experiences. It propelled me professionally as a medical doctor to later specialize in the research and counseling of patients who had diverse spiritually transformative experiences. It awakened intense spiritual hunger in me. I developed a new strong yearning to read from the Bible daily as well as to study other religions, religions, holy books. My, de my desire to meditate regularly intensified. So one thing leads to another, but she's searching for answers because of her experiences. What's next? In 1990, how old is she then? Uh, much older. Hmm? 27. Yeah. No, 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 because we're on 53, so that's 47. You know, 53, 63, 73, 83, 40. Oh, she's 37. 37. Uh, so this Mr. Experience is where she got her mission. And this is what she says. She's, she's out in nature one evening, and uh, she has this experience. She says, a brilliant white light descended upon me from above. I felt that my head had cracked, and the open top of my head had become a brilliant beacon of light, radiating light in all directions. Without any words having been heard or spoken, I suddenly knew that I must now come out of the closet and begin to talk publicly to doctors, patients, the public, the media, anyone who will listen to declare that spiritually transformative experiences were real. Because in the 1970s, when she started having these experiences, if anyone talked about you know, near death, or spirit, it's like you know, you're crazy, or if, if, if you meet a Christian, well then you know, it's the devil, or a scientist, it's just a chemical imbalance or something. But actually, time has changed so much. In our lifetime, my lifetime, now there's so much information and it's so much more readily accepted about these near-death experiences. What's next? <laughs> she has so many experiences. I'm le me leaving some out as well. 1995. Now she's... Um, she's She's 42, yeah? It's not your time, near-death experience. So now she's on an aeroplane again. <laughs> yeah. So this true. So, and this aeroplane is experiencing again, it's, um, it's Canada, it's winter, there's snow, it's a snowstorm, and there's turbulence, yeah? And she's thinking to myself, well, is this, is this going to, now am I going to die? Because actually she didn't die, even though she had a near-death experience, she never died. Uh, so what happened here is that the, the, uh, the pilot was trying to land, but then he saw these co coyotes on the, uh, the uh, landing strip, and he had to, in these animals, so he had to suddenly uh, raise the, the aeroplane in the air, otherwise he would have crashed into these animals, yes? And that created a kind of a screaming uh, sound in the engines, and the, the plane was all over the place, and people in the plane were screaming and crying, and she thought, I'm going to die. This Now I'm going to die. So what did she do? She decided to meditate in that moment, to calm herself down. She expected to die. So she said, well, I know what's going to happen. I know where I'm going to go, so I will meditate, prepare. And she says this, I closed my eyes and quickly went into deep meditation. Instantly, 
I felt my spirit, my consciousness, leave my body. I lost all awareness of my physical body seated in the crashing plane. I then found myself moving rapidly upwards through a dark but calm and peaceful space. It felt a deep peace and inner stillness. Suddenly, descending from above, a luminous being of light appeared in front of me, blocking my path upwards towards the light. The being then spoke to me mentally. It's not your time. Instantly, in the blink of an eye, I found my spirit back in my physical body again, on board the Air Canada plane. It wasn't a time. And actually, the pilot did manage to uh, land. But um, after that, when she landed, it wasn't the end of her experience. Then she started having a mystical experience. She says this. After this experience, I had an ongoing mystical communion 24 hours a day while I was awake, alert and actively functioning in the world and while asleep. Nobody had to tell me or explain to me what I was experiencing. I knew to the core of my soul what I was experiencing. I was experiencing divine communion. This state of ongoing mystical communion remained with me for about two months. Yeah. Another, you know, it's like every single moment I'm experiencing this oneness with God for two months. What's next? <laughs> okay, so now we go to 2003, when she has a traumatic brain injury. So 2003, now she's uh, is at 50 years of age. 50 years of age. Uh, she was with a friend and she went to Niagara Falls for a day. And when she was there, she had another missing experience, this experience. But it was night time when they were going to leave. Uh, they went to some restaurant and it was very icy and she slipped on the ice. And she died, actually. This time, she really died. And she says this. So, she came into this, again, this realm of light. And in this realm of light, two beings appeared to her. These two beings. Who are they? <laughs> she says this. I saw two angelic luminous beings of light who seemed to be waiting for me to greet me and welcome me into the heavenly realm. I instantly recognized them. They were two great saints, spiritual masters from my spiritual tradition, saints whom I loved, revered, and considered my gurus, Paramahansa Yogananda and Mahavata Babaji. <laughs> Both of these were like a very, you could say, ascended masters, who read, achieved a high level of spiritual development on earth, and she knew all about them from her studies and from her practicing of yoga. And they gave her a choice. And she could go back if she wanted. And basically she said, well, you decide. <laughs> I can't decide. And instantly, she came back. But when she came back, you know, she, she, she was dead. But she came to, and uh, she had suffered a uh, traumatic brain injury. And traumatic brain injuries can have a wide-ranging, long-term physical and psychological effects. So she'd become, she'd been writing books, she'd been giving public speeches. Um, she was still a doctor, and, and you know, and uh, so all that stopped because she couldn't concentrate. She it was very difficult for her. So for 12 years, um, her life became limited. Yeah. But then what happened after 12 years? This happened. She had a... Uh, she, in 2016, she had a sudden brain healing. How old is she now? Not so long ago. She's 63. And this is what she says about a sudden brain healing. Through the grace of God, I had a miraculous and sudden brain healing with an eruption of white light in the center of my brain. My writing-inspired creativity spontaneously was reawakened. 
After years of complete loss, it was as if my brain and creativity had awakened from a 12-year slumber. What a life. You want more? <laughs> but this is one person's life. If you have these experiences, it's going to have a dramatic impact upon your life. One experience, but this is many. So why did she have all these? Because it, it was God's purpose that through all these experiences, she would understand people who had these kinds of spiritually transformative experience and give them a voice and be able to explain them. And so actually she, in 2020, which is just uh, three years ago, she founded the Spiritual Awakenings International, an organization which can bring together uh, people uh, who have had experiences and they don't know who to go to, who to talk to. So this is her life mission. And um, apart from the fact that this is her mission and all these experiences, she's learned from it. So I come back to the divine principle. The divine principle is, uh, Father has said, this can embrace all religions and all philosophies. So one reason I studied people like her is, well, uh, this should be, if her experiences are true, they should be able to expe be explained by the divine principle. Yes? Because the divine principle is meant to be this all-embracing understanding. Because if we want to bring peace on this earth, we need to be able to unite all people and bring people from different religions who can recognize that what we're saying is relevant to them and make sense to them. So she, um, has, she talks about my four soul lessons. First of all, she learned, she's learned, and she says, this is not just my ideas, this is my experience. From my real experience, this is my reality. We are immortal souls in bodies to learn and grow. Is this true? Is this principled? Yeah, yeah so that's true. So we can put a tick against that. Okay, and then, we are all loved by the universal higher power. Is that true? Well, because she's had such dramatic experiences, then I have to read what she says, because, uh, you know, when she went to this realm of light and she felt this unconditional love, I mean, we don't experience it like that normally, do we? So this will tell us we have something to look forward to, but also we can understand the reality of God, how powerful God's love is. She says this, the second most important soul lesson that I learned is that we, that a higher power exists and we are all loved profoundly and unconditionally by a divine creator, our mother, father, God. Do you agree that God is a mother, father, God? Yeah. That's pretty good, spot on, yes. <laughs> then, I've experienced our divine higher power as being imminent in all creation, omnipresent, interpenetrating, in, interpenetrating all of creation. No distance separates us from our beloved parent, God. Is God our beloved parent? Yeah. Spot on, yes. <laughs> because every atom of creation is an outpouring of God, a ray of the divine source. We are each like rays radiating from the divine sun or drops forming a part of the cosmic ocean of God. We are all devised diverse expressions of our one creator God. God is with each, within each and every one of us. In our hearts and in our souls, there is no separation. Would you agree? The reality is we're not separated. Just our thinking is. Every time we love or feel loved, every time we manifest kindness, compassion, forgiveness, courage, endurance, or generosity, we are expressing a small aspect of God within our hearts and souls. Would you agree? Yeah. Spot on. Our divine parent God is ever-present. Divine parent, is that right? God is our divine parent? Spot on. <laughs> is ever-present within all of creation, smiling at us through every beautiful sunset, in the beauty of flowers, in the sweet song of birds, in the goodness in human actions, and in the inspiration of human genius. Would you agree? Yes. You just got to look outside the window. And then she, she ends with this. And again, this is very principled. So listen carefully. My experience of the divine higher power is that it is like both an infinitely loving 
Divine Mother, Divine Mother Force, who loves us completely and unconditionally, and also like a wise, discerning Divine Father Force, who teaches and disciplines us when we make errors to help us to learn and grow. Would you agree? Mother, Father, God. Parent. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, and then she also says, ultimately we find our way back home to a state of ongoing God communion. So, Father talks about our real home is the spirit world. That's, where we, that's our true home. She talks about that as well. Two more lessons. Meditation and moral living can speed soul evolution. Would you agree? So she learned meditation, opening herself up. But she also prayed. She actually says she identifies herself as a um, Christian um, yogi. She both comes from a Christian tradition, and but she practices yoga. And our movement is trying to bring East and West together. Is that right? So therefore she's demonstrating that and she's, she's able to bring the two together. And moral living, doing good deeds, yes? So that's the principle. And finally, there is always hope for a brighter tomorrow. She died almost many times. Uh, her, she had this dramatic brain healing. She's been guided her whole life. You know, but she feels such hope, and we should feel the same. Because when she was in the spiritual world, it's like these uh, beings she met, they had been with her. They said, oh, it's not your time yet. Or, uh, but it's like on this physical earth with all the problems around us, we may think, you know, is the world ever going to change? But we have to understand that God, God is working in many, many ways. She's an example of one person, how God is working. So God is alive. God is real. And we, when we had this uh, life-changing moment and decided to join this movement, we should remember how we felt. We should keep that excitement. We shouldn't just become old and, oh, you know, I'm just waiting to go. And, well, it never really worked out. And, oh, look, my children are not following, so... Uh, I suppose I'll just kind of wait. No, we have to believe that God is working right now. And even though I'm almost 70 years of age, I cannot think, you know, it's time to go. I feel uh, inspired, and I, I feel the message that we have can change this world. Do you believe that? Yes. I didn't hear you. Do you believe that? Yes. And we have to be uh, really alert and awake and wait for the opportunities. It's interesting Students come every year from gymnasium and ask questions. This year, I felt there was a difference. I felt they really felt at home here. They felt a warm atmosphere, felt welcome. And they were really kind of um, interested and uh, uh, really open and, and listening carefully. And, and uh, we had, one time, we had this kind of forgiveness ceremony. And then two students joined us and took the holy wine. Yeah. And, and also, on the holy day we had, three students came and participated there. Never happened before. So I think, on the surface, we may say there's so many problems. But we need to believe. You know, Christians, what they do is they believe. They have faith. Anything can happen. We need faith to move mountains. We need to believe. Not just to wait for true parents or mother to do something on our worldwide movement. We, within ourselves, need to be f fired up and inspired. And when we meet people to say, hey, I've got something that, uh, that, that would excite you and would interest you. And, uh, we should be proud of who we are and maintain, maintain that heart you know, to share and to live by the words that we have. And with that, I would like to end by putting these questions up to ask you, have you had a life-changing moment? What impact did it have on your life? Why did you join our movement? And why have you stayed? And then I'd like to say, finally, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening.